Right, ladies and gentlemen, Graham Swan, of course, joins us again in a fantastic piece of content that we've always had on Cricket.com. It's called Life in Pictures, and I'm actually eagerly looking forward to this one because, of course, we know about Swanee and all of the stories on and off the field. We've picked out 11 pictures of his life, which is going to be fun to talk about. Graham Swan, first and foremost, thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Good to be on. <laughs> Great to be on. All right. Let's, of course, throw you the first one. We're going to do this chronologically, not from start to finish, but from finish to start, really. The back okay. is what yeah. the producers told me. The first one is not the one I love, really. This one, which is quite uh, something. Now, bear with me. This is you and Karen Clifton, uh, yeah. of course, they come dancing on BBC One. Yeah. This is, I think, the Birmingham Arena in January 2019. How yeah. much did you enjoy yourself there? So that is that's not actually from the TV show. During the TV show, I was partnered with a Zimbabwean girl called Oti Mabuse, and that was brilliant fun. She was a hard-nosed woman. I said to her on day one, look, I'm a sportsman. I don't want you to give me false praise or say I'm good at something when I'm not. Just be honest with me. That way I'll improve. And I regretted that by day two because she was horrible. <laughs> she absolutely ripped me to shreds. But we, we're great mates now. And after the TV show, they do a live tour. That picture with Karen Clifton was during the live tour. Look how skinny I am in that picture. Honestly, I lost about two and a half stone. And look at the hair. Look how suave. Wow. Woo! Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. I love your attire over there. And, of course, the cheeky pose. You're always a poser. <laughs> but speaking of poses, here's another one. And this is on the field, off the field. I don't know how you want to term this, but this is, of course, after your playing days. Now, how special is ringing the bell at Lords? Now, this was, of course, 2017, September. I think this was the England-West Indies test match. Uh, many people, of course, are invited to, of course, ring the bell. What does it really mean? And just walk us through this, please. Yeah, it's amazing. So, when you're playing, you always, uh, you always hear the bell going at the dressing room. And it's quite famous. They make a big deal of it. And you'd hear it announced over the ground. Like, Ladies and gentlemen, today's bell is being rung by... And they read through someone's stats or someone famous, and then they ring the bell. And I didn't actually think they'd ask me to do it when I finished playing, um, because they never asked me to coach or anything in the England team. So I thought, oh, maybe they've forgotten and don't, don't really care that I'm their best spin bowler they've ever had. Um, and so I just I got asked one day. And one thing you will notice in that picture, what a lovely Windsor knot I've got in my tie. You wouldn't believe how many players in our, look at that big fat Windsor. How many players in the England dress room I had to go around and help do their ties up because they didn't know how to do it? Shocking. Most of them can't even write their own name and spell it right. <laughs> Did you like the egg and bacon ties? Because we always see yeah. all those MC members over there. Hello, chaps. How are you? Having like a small champagne and whatnot. But did you kind of fit into that avatar? Yeah, well, I'm I'm an MCC member. That was my tie. That's my tie. So um, I was at the MCC, even though I will say this, it's got some of the snobbiest people in the world as members. So proper, horrible, old school upper class. Oh, hello, boy. Oh, my dear. These shouldn't be playing on our turf. Yeah. Women. Yeah. At the MCC. Never. Never. There's a lot of people like that. However, there's some brilliant people there as well. And, uh, I became a member about 10, 15 years ago. It's also very good for parking your car in central London. It will cost you a second mortgage otherwise. Um, and you get to watch all this amazing cricket at, at Lords. So I was chuffed when they asked me to ring the bell. I fitted in, obviously, beautifully there. You saw it. You saw the big smile on my face. Um, and, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, you know, there's always a smile in your face, and that's good to see in St. John's Wood. Like you said, the parking rate's outrageous over there. So, well played, Swanee. Uh, speaking of well played, here's the third picture that we want to bring to your screens right now. And this is in Wentworth, of course, taking part in the BMW Championship. Yeah. Uh, is golf something close to your heart? What's your handicap? I mean, are you a man of many sports? I love golf. I play off six. I should be a lot better. That actually... Um, you, you, this will be a journey through the different weight phases of Graham Swan because, Jesus, I've had a couple of hot dinners there after that Strictly Come Down scene. I've obviously gone, no, I'll have a few donuts now for the next six months. That particular day at Wentworth, on the I played with Danny Willett. Danny Willett had just won the Masters. And then this is the British Open. And I was grouped with Michael Vaughan and Danny Willett. And then some other dude from BMW. And anyway, first tee at Wentworth. I outdrive Danny Willett, hit it 20 yards further in, and I'm on the green. He gets a par, I get a par. I think this will be good. The next 16 holes, 
I hit my ball out of bounds 13 times. Those who played at Wentworth, there is barely any out of bounds. You have to hit it miles. I had the worst round of golf of my life. My brother was caddying with me, and after about 15 holes, he said, look, I'm not being funny, little brother. You're embarrassing me now. Please stop this. It was terrible, but good. We, we love the honesty. We love the modesty. And like you mentioned, Wentworth, I'm thinking out of bounds. I mean, how, ma- how bad must you be? But, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, if you had a handicap of six, you're really kind of showing off, so to speak, over there. We'll leave that there because you played another game. Not a game, but this is three years earlier, 2013, in that Australian tour at the Ayers Rock. Now, wait for this. You're going to love this. This is you throwing the boomerang. There's a little Johnny Besto behind you just admiring there is. the boomerang abilities. Talk to you know what? How much fun that did you have, is, young? That is not long before I had to retire. At that point, my elbow was so bad that I couldn't feel my fingers when I bowled. And we had this trip to Ayers Rock. We, we played a game at Ayers Rock, and I got four wickets just against like a Prime Minister's level, whatever. And honestly, while I was feeling it, imagine playing a game of cricket at Ayers Rock, by the way. It's like 45 degrees in the shade. When you batted, the sun felt like it was cooking your head inside the helmet. Um and I remember being on the outfield, realizing it was there that, that my career had finished. And so when a few of us went to see Ayers Rock and they said, who's going to throw this boomerang? Normally, I'd never do something like that. I think I don't want to throw my arm out. I thought it's knackered already. I might as well give it a go. And believe it or not, that came back to me. You have to throw it in a certain way. That came back to me. I was made up. I was the best of everyone who tried it. I mean, is that is that something that actually you guys can learn instantly or is it something that it takes time to perfect? No, it's, it's all about the way you hold it. So it, you hold it, weirdly, almost like an off-spinner. If you imagine the off-spinner's grip, if you just then place your finger and thumb together, that's how you hold it in there. And it's a very similar action. When you throw it, you whip your wrist, and it just sends it off, and it goes high, and it comes back. I mean, I didn't catch it on the way back, but I got it almost back to me, whereas everyone else's would just disappear in the field or plummeted into the ground. No, I mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, only time will tell if Ashwin or Sutlain or Murli were also great boomerang throwers in their yeah. heyday. Um, let's move <laughs> on quickly because there was a lot of fan appreciation on the ground for you. This is 2013 as well, where you guys, of course, thumped Australia. And check this out for a picture. You're just having an absolute balmy time, pun intended, with the fans out there. How close were your relationship with the fans? Because you guys literally have one of the best Fan bases in cricket. Yeah, I always got on very well with the fans. If you notice, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was during a day that was rained off. Because that's in Manchester, and I'm sure that was rained off or a one-day game of finish. And we went out to say thank you to the fans who turned up and said it's to sign some autographs. And look, I was thirsty. I just signed a lot of autographs. And those guys there are obviously on a stag do. And a lot of a lot of people not from England might be not be familiar with the stag do. Um Sort of tradition in this country you get dressed up in anything you want and it's normally old-fashioned drinking gear like Bavarian drinking gear and he offered me a beer and you know being one to always be at one with the fans I thought it'd be rude not to drink it yeah two things about that you're right about Old Trafford it was rain induced and hence of course you guys are spending time with fans and just imagine this in a pre-COVID era I mean right now I don't think Players who live in venture that close to the fans, but that's what COVID has done. So thanks, COVID, for ruining it all for the fans in the future. <laughs> Let's move on because you're a man of many talents. We showed about, of course, the strictly dancing, which is funny. But this one is, of course, another poser. And you're wow. not looking out of the window. Do you play much of the guitar or any other instrument for that matter? I do play the guitar. I'm just looking for it in here. No, oh, get it. In this... lovely, if you can get it's it. Not... I don't know where it is. It's not. All right. Yeah. We had a bit of a, a, a sort out, not like it might be in the garage. Oh man, I do, yeah. I play the guitar, so I was in a band for a long time, lead singer in a band called Dr. Comfort and the Lurid Revelations, just playing Sunday evening floor fillers, rock hits from around the globe. Um, but we never play Men Down Under, <laughs> all right? Yeah, I mean, I was. I was just going to kind of ask you that, but you've kind of taken it off me because we also had Mark Butcher early on with us and he loves his music. And we can yeah. know how. Oh, whoa, whoa. Music. Yeah. So th- there's a difference. Butch is amazing. <laughs> Butch is properly amazing on the guitar, voice like velvet, very serious performer. That picture makes me look really serious looking out the window, like broody. It's like an album cover. Trust me, I'm the absolute anti- antithesis of serious when i play a guitar i mess around i have a laugh i jump around i'm not a great singer but i'm a brilliant frontman. 
No, absolutely. We, we take that, of course. And big up to all, to all the Getty lads. Of course, Lawrence Griffith with that immaculate picture. Of Loza. <laughs> which is probably, of course, framed somewhere in your house. Uh, some of the last couple of ones here. We have five remaining. We'll speed through them. Uh, this, perhaps, your spin twin, the best person you bowled with. I don't know. Monty, Monty. and Swan, of course. 2012 Indian fans know all about it. Just tell me about how much you enjoyed bowling with this man. And was it a case of you guys being the best that England's ever produced in terms of spinners? Yeah, I would say that England got very lucky with us because um, I didn't listen to our coaches and Monty couldn't understand that bowling spin. Very much like it ended up better bowling than the England coaching system was uh, was spitting out. And, and I still maintain that England spin is not as good as it should be because they don't coach it properly. And just a word on that 2012 series, because, I mean, some of you guys bowl some great deliveries. I mean, you talk about one's ball of the century and whatnot, but some of those balls that you guys bowled to Tindulka, Dravid and whatnot, do you guys literally thrive with the subcontinent when you look at pitches like that? Yeah, I always remember turning up at the Wankidi to play there on that red soil and realising after, I mean... India got a lot of runs. Pajara got a big hundred in the first innings, but you could tell it was bouncing like a tennis ball. It was going boing, boing, really good bounce. And so when it started turning, what that series was, that series, it's, things went so well for us to this point. Please, if you can, find the delivery I get Virat Kohli out with at the Wankini Stadium, caught mid off by Stephen Finn. It's a full toss. I bowled the worst ball of the series, just slipped out of my hand, low full toss. But we'd been so much on top of India, his eyes lit up and he hit it straight to mid-off and got caught. It was hilarious. Yeah, you got Virat a few times out, I think in all formats, if uh, my producer tells me correctly. Let's move on to, of course, 8, 9, 10, 11 before we say goodbye to you. Now, we know that you're a big football fan. Here's a picture How of you playing football. Uh, I think this one, oh, wait for it. I think March 4th, 2009, this was taken in Trinidad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. while the West Indies are leading 1-0. But the chat here I want to have with you is about football. First and foremost, did you guys take your football seriously during training? And secondly, yeah. tell me all how it started with you being a Newcastle fan, please. So, yes, England is taken... Football is taken incredibly seriously by the England players. It's to warm up every day. And when you think that you have to warm up every day to play cricket, there is nothing more boring than running between cones and doing field and drills. And players get very disillusioned with that. So we had this three-touch football. No tackling allowed. You weren't allowed to wear spikes. It was all about getting moving. And honestly, I, th I think a lot of days, half of the England team were more bothered about how the football game went that morning than how the test match went that they just played in. We probably lost a lot of good, talented players because they just couldn't play football, so we dropped them. Um, and Newcastle, I'm a Newcastle fan because my family are from the North East. I'm not. I was born in Northampton, but first generation outside of the North East. In England, you don't get to choose who your club is. You're told by your father or your grandfather who you support. And when my granddad Wilfred said to me, son, boys in this family support Newcastle United. So you support Newcastle United. As a four-year-old, you're kind of tied by that. I'll tell you what, I love it. I love it if we beat them. I can just never get enough of Kevin Keegan's draft in 1996. Because if we look back at that, I mean, he made a mistake <laughs> early taking on Alex they, Ferguson. They've got to go to Middlesbrough on Thursday. And I would love it if we beat them now. I would love that. Ah! The words, well, that I is... Tell you what, that Newcastle not winning the Premier League that year, 96, yeah. is and throwing it away with a 12-point lead at Christmas hurts more than me having to retire from cricket. <laughs> I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have rather carried on playing for two years in agony had Newcastle won the league that year. Yeah, it was a shocking year, but it, it got better. I think you guys signed Alan Shearer from Blackburn the following year, so I think it only got better... <laughs> For all Newcastle fans over there. And now, of course, with the Saudi investment onwards. And we'll be all right. In five years' time, we'll be all right. Yeah, I think a lot of Newcastle fans personally have said, you know what, we're going to win a Premier League title before Man United. So in your face, Abney. So I'm like, yeah, OK, let's see how that comes <laughs> up. Um, finally, last three ones left here. Yeah. And these are really interesting. Um, this is 1999, believe it or not. February, wait for it. It's in Zimbabwe. With all your pals. Now, you're on the extreme left. There's Andrew Flintoff. There's, of course, Darren Maddy, Matt Windows, yeah. and Robert Keys, if I'm right. That's right. That's exactly who it is. That is, we went on an A tour to, um, to Zimbabwe. I'm only about 18, 19 years old then. And it rained nearly every day. First 10, 15 days, banged it down with rain. Um, and we just did this big, it used to be a Jurgen Klinsman because Klinsman once scored for Tottenham and he dived. 
and all the water sprayed everywhere. So that was his celebration. So that was our Jürgen Klinsmann celebration after a game of rugby in Zimbabwe. Brilliant tour, though. Brilliant time. Great memories. I'm loving how you found all these pictures. Lawrence Griffiths, like you say, and the boys at Getty have come up with some belters here. Yeah, I mean, there were so many to really pick and choose. We could have gone for 20 because they were also like uh, the Barmy Army. I think there was one picture where they had mini swans in the stand, which is really cool yes. to see. I mean, just showing yes. how much you've appreciated your time over there. But one thing which stands up for you in your cricketing career and people remembering you was, of course, not just this dance, but this Ashes series. First of all, <laughs> How much of it is for an English fan or a cricketer to win it? Is it the epitome for anyone to, of course, play the game and win the Ashes from an England perspective? And secondly, yeah, th what do you about the sprinkler dance after that? I think, to, to be honest, it is the epitome for an Englishman to win the Ashes. Uh, my favourite Ashes series that I won was my first 2009 at home uh, because I'd never experienced it. I never thought I would, and then I got to do it. But that one, 2010 in Australia... Uh, first time England had won there for 20 odd years. And that sprinkler, it, the sprinkler came about. It rained one day during a, a tour game in Adelaide. And a few of us lads had gone out for dinner. And dinner had turned into dancing. And dancing had gone into a nightclub establishment. We were there way too late, way later than we should have been, if we were being professionally honest. Um, but we turned up the next day and it was raining. And we were all laughing our heads off how we dodged a bullet there because we were supposed to be fielding all day in this meaningless tour game. But we didn't have to now. We were all hung over. And we had a stereo on the floor and everyone was doing a little dance. And Paul Collin would just say, oh, do you remember Do you remember that girl in that nightclub last night doing the sprinkler like that? And as he said it, Andy Flair had just walked in the changing room and he heard him. And so we all got a massive rollicking for going out. But it was like, we're winning test matches. And Andy was like, you better win this test series or else I'll kill you all. And we won it. And so that was um, after winning the test match at Melbourne. That was our celebration on the field to to all the Barmy Army. Believe it or not, there's 20,000 people in that ground. That photo shows zero because all the Australians in the other side of the ground had all gone home. But behind the cameraman's lens, there's about 20,000 Englishmen singing raucously. It was brilliant. Yeah, I've never seen the MCG kind of being filtered out so quickly, especially on day one or day two of how it was. But two things would stand out from both the 2009 and 2010 with that. You had Ricky Ponting on toes and we make no mistake about that. Finally, this is the last one. And this is exactly, believe it or not, 23 and a half years ago, Swanee. This is a real throwback to end on a good note. And take a look at this is brilliant. I mean, you've just changed so much for the better or the worse. Let us know in the comments well, below. But well, great. look, I don't know if you've got the book in India. There's a kid's book over here called The Ugly Duckling. Is that something you're... So the ugly duckling, and he gets bullied everywhere he goes, and this ugly little duck. But you know what he blossoms into? One day, a beautiful swan. And so I like to think that that book was written specifically about me. I was not an early flowerer, let's face it. It's a very cold pre-season photograph at Northamptonshire. People had bad hair in the 90s. I mean, it's not great now, but it's better than that. But yeah, thanks for bringing that one up. Super. I mean, Graham, it's been absolutely brilliant to chat with you and to do this life in pictures with you. We've just got so much to really uh, understand about you and your personality on and off the field. And we've always been a big fan. And a last word for cricket.com and the guys who've been working tirelessly behind the scenes. Well, exactly. You're doing a cracking job. Keep on doing your cracking job because we'll need you doing a cracking job when you get me back for the ashes. It's the only place. Subscribe. Remember, subscribe. Graham Swan, thank you so much for your time. We'll catch you soon. Hopefully the ashes and wish you well. I know it's not been the I mean, ideal way to get this rolling, but nevertheless, it's been fun, fun and fun. Super. Thanks, Swanee. Same. Thank you. For your no, time my pleasure, man. I'll sure. see you soon, dude. Legend. Yeah. Bye. Right, so that was Graham Swan just pouring out his thoughts and certain pictures that we've kind of rolled clock back with him and what a time it was, of course, back in those days in 98 and 99. There's more to come, of course, with Swan, hopefully in the future, but you can catch up the rest of the content, as you can see, in all our YouTube playlists.